us for this 40-minute webinar on mobile commerce UX best practices. My name is Carly Sear. I'm the Marketing Campaigns Manager here at Mobify, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. First off, we'd like to say a special thanks to Astound Commerce, who is co-sponsoring this webinar. After we put together today's presentation, we actually got the chance to sit down with Astound's Director of Interactive Strategy, Andrew Motaz, to get his insights on how performance affects conversion rates. So we'll be sharing his blog post on that topic as a follow-up to today's webinar. Now on to today's agenda. Mobify's design manager, JB Allenson, will be covering mobile commerce UX best practices to help you reduce friction and increase your conversion rates. JB has been designing user experiences on the web for over 20 years. He leads our Mobify design team in creating exceptional e-commerce experiences for some of the world's leading brands, ensuring they're all performant and friction free. Now, just before we begin, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, we'll be hosting a live Q&A after today's presentation, so be sure to tweet your questions using the webinar hashtag mcommerceux2017. You can also submit your questions through the webinar dashboard. Uh, on your screen right now, you'll see a rough outline of what that dashboard looks like. On the top left-hand navigation, you can click the Q&A button to open up the question portal and type your questions right in there. Uh, just a note, if the raised hand feature is present on your screen, please ignore that because we've disabled it for today's webinar. Now I'll pass it over to JB to tell us about mobile commerce UX best practices. Thank you, Carly. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to talk to everyone and thank you everyone for your attention today. Uh, I first want to start off by uh, apologizing for my voice. I've had uh, lost my voice a week ago and it uh, has finally come back, uh, thankfully for this webinar. Uh, but I do sound like a bit of a broken Skype connection sometimes. So uh, bear with me and uh, hopefully uh, you uh, enjoy the presentation ahead. Um, so I'm really excited to showcase our top mobile e-commerce best practices here, here at mobile. Uh, Mobify, I'm really uh, excited about this topic, really passionate about talking about this to people. I, I spend a lot of my time presenting uh, this content uh, to young designers, and they're always uh, very excited to learn about this and uh, try to make their mobile experiences amazing. I thought what I'd do is I'd start off and just quickly talk about the landscape that, uh, as a designer, we're working in in mobile at the moment. Uh, this year, mobile traffic has surpassed desktop traffic in e-commerce. Uh, it's an exciting time that we've been sort of forecasting for quite a while and it has finally happened. However, uh, in terms of e-commerce conversion rates, desktop still is a substantial lead over mobile devices such as phone and tablet. And I think as a designer, uh, there's a great opportunity here to fill that gap, uh, reduce friction and make shopping and buying on your mobile device uh, as fast and enjoyable as the desktop experience. The other thing that's really changed is shoppers' expectations have really been drastically influenced by a native uh, app user experience. Uh, we use these apps all the time. Uh, they definitely are different than the mobile web, uh, and that's drastic, uh, changed our perception of what the mobile web uh, UI should be. The other exciting thing is uh, new technologies that are coming out of Google these days, such as progressive web apps and accelerated mobile pages, AMP. Um, these are really changing our mind and our expectations around web performance. It's really an exciting time. Um, as Carly mentioned, I've been designing for the web for 20 years now. Um, it was always a slow, you know, you'd click something and, and you'd wait for that page to load and that's been getting better and better. And now with uh, mobile performance, uh, with progressive web apps, it's, it's shockingly fast and amazing to create experiences that are, you know, you tap something and it, something immediately shows. Uh, it's an amazing experience and, and really exciting to be part of. Today I'm going to talk, uh, showcase about 35 to 40 of our best practices. Um, but first I'm going to sort of discuss how to use defaults uh, for your decision making. And then we'll group those best practices into three major topics. Reducing anxiety through communication, making form field entry easy, and creating obvious interactions. First, we'll jump into sort of making decisions with defaults. And I just want to uh, clarify and explain what the word default here is. A default is something uh, that just happens if you choose not to make any decision. So from a programming perspective, the default, the default of something uh, displaying, you know, the programmer doesn't have to do anything. And 
design can be the same way. And I like, I like to treat these best practices as defaults. I love this quote from Steve McCarthy. A good user experience can be defined in many ways, but one measure is the ability to reduce the user's effort to think. And I think as UX designers, we really have to work hard to reduce that user's expectation of thinking um, and make sure that we're clearly explaining uh, what they need to do, how they need to do it, so that they can be successful in the, the job that they've come to do uh, on your site. If I look at my, uh, here's my home screen on my phone. Um, if we look at the first screen, it's entirely a native apps. And these are apps that I interact with every single day, multiple times a day. And my expectation of those apps is that they, they can be discoverable. Um, the iconography, the features can be really um, uh, uh, obscure and maybe create the, uh, force me to, to discover what they do. You know, Snapchat is a great uh, example of this. Um, where their features are really uh, discoverable and you have to uncover them through usage. However, if I've navigated my phone, maybe three, six, seven screens in, I land on all my shopping apps. And these are apps that I use maybe you know once every three months, maybe I'm sitting on the couch, I browse them uh, every six months or so. And that made me realize, it sort of changed the idea of how I think about e-commerce. And it made me start to, to, to ask these questions. You know, how often do you buy pants? Um, I asked around the office, you know, typically it's maybe three, three months, maybe six months, you buy a new pair of pants. Some people it's once a year. So can you imagine what it's like uh, if you knew as a designer that the shopper into your website is experiencing your interface every two to three months and maybe they're spending 10 minutes over a couple of days making a decision on buying that pair of pants. That drastically changes how you approach your experience design. You have to make it 100% obvious all the time. And that leads us to our sort of first uh, best practice and our first default. Make everything 100% obvious all the time. When you encounter a problem, use the default best practice as your first choice and then go from there. Argue about it, discuss it, use research to, to, to adjust your thinking away from the best practice but use that as your sort of default decision-making tool. And here's an example, here's two examples of where uh, best practice is, is broken. Uh, if we look at uh, the Lululemon website, as the shopper scrolls down, the, the product content is exposed by default. Uh, this is a great user experience because the shopper can simply keep on scrolling and engage in, in well-formatted, clear content, um, and they don't have to work or, or, or search out where that content would live. So that's what we would recommend, showing your content by default. However, if we look at an experience like Garmin, their product information and product specifications is very in-depth, very detailed. And by exposing this by default, would have actually created more friction. A shopper might get lost as they scroll a very, very long page. So instead, uh, the user experience designer decided to collapse this content into an accordion, this, thus creating a much better experience. So this is a great example of where you break a best practice, where you start with one, uncover that it's not quite uh, appropriate for this use case, and you adjust. And so now I'll start moving into uh, all of our best practices. The first big bucket of best practices is about reducing anxiety through communication. When a shopper searches on Google for a product, they're often, they often encounter brands that they're not familiar with. And studies have shown that a shopper will land on a homepage, scroll from top to bottom, and try to infer the site content uh, that that site offers and see if it has a product a category that they're seeking. And so it's critical that your homepages don't, aren't cluttered with self-promotion or promotional content and obscure the product categories that you have to offer. So always include a, include a visual navigation of all the products you offer, product categories you offer, sorry, um, so that the shopper can easily identify that your brand is one that they want to shop with and continue to browse. The next best practice is about provide value for the shopper. If you're requesting uh, 
a shopper to log in or register or sign up for a new uh, email newsletter or a push notification, make sure you're providing clear value to them of what uh, you offer. Here with Outlook, they have a nice little summary sentence here of uh, receiving 50 to 70% off um, uh, products. That's a clear benefit to me to sign up and join Outlook. The next one is around uh, tap indicators or action indicators. I can't tell you how many times I've ordered products. I open the box and there's two or three of them in the box. Uh, I've done that on numerous occasions. My wife uh, shakes her head at me constantly. Uh, and I'm like, wow, that was weird. I didn't think I did that. And the reason I did that is because I didn't feel like the ad to beg recognized my tap. So it's critical that you use animation and, and indicators to, to notify the shopper that they've correctly tapped a button and that it's added their product to cart. The next one is around using descriptive buttons. On mobile, we never want a shopper to land on a page that they, that they weren't expecting. So to do this, we need to clearly communicate where that shopper is going to land when they tap a button. So we use words like continue to secure payment. We don't use words like just simply continue or next or an arrow. That doesn't give any indication of what the shopper will be experiencing next. So use uh, robust descriptions in all of your buttons so that they clearly communicate where the shopper is going to be going. Shoppers still today on mobile don't feel like mobile is as secure, is as secure as desktop. And we know that this isn't true with HTTPS. It's just as secure as your desktop experience. <clears throat> and so what we need to do is, is appeal to their irrationality and communicate a sense of security at all times. So it's really important, kind of back to that uh, robust description button, using words like security um, or secure, start your secure checkout, pay securely now, and also using lock icons. And a funny study actually showed that the bigger that lock icon is, the more secure a shopper feels about that page. A completely irrational thought, but uh, we need to make sure that we're dealing with that irrational behavior from shoppers. Another a great example is simply changing the color behind your credit card entry area makes the shopper feel like this is a special area and that, oh, this must be secure. I can safely enter in my credit card information. On mobile, it's critical that we focus the shopper at all times. So often I see sign in and register forms where there's two forms technically on the same page. On desktop, this can work because we can separate them visually. But on mobile, everything kind of collides together. So it's critical that you use a tab um, segmented controller uh, to only show the form that needs to be filled out at one time. So here's a great example on Eddie Power where we have sign in as one tab and register as the other with a single form and a submit button for each. Clearly focusing the shopper on exactly the task they need to complete. 37% of shoppers abandon their purchase because they un uncover unexpected shipping costs. So it's critical that you communicate shipping costs or how much more they need to purchase to get free shipping uh, at all times and as often as possible. Here's a number of different examples how, they're, how we do this. We often use banners, uh, we use special callouts in the checkout, and we wanna make sure that the shopper isn't surprised at all by, by shipping fees, um, and how much will qualify them for free shipping. A big theme in a lot of these best practices is really us as designers and developers to do work for the shopper and don't make them do the work. Here's an example uh, of a best practice where we recommend you do the calculation of when the package will actually arrive uh, to the shopper rather than giving them estimated uh, days to deliver. That, if you give them days to deliver, it forces them to think in their mind, oh, when will that be? When will I actually get that? Whereas if you just simply give them the actual date and the day, it's a much better experience for them. The exciting thing about progressive mobile is how fast the experiences are. And, and one way that we can actually make experiences feel even faster is by improving the perceived performance through the use of placeholder content. And placeholder content are these gray uh, blocks of content 
that load quickly into the experience as all of the other content is loading in. And this uh, gives a, a sense of perceived performance to the shopper. They feel like something's happening, so the site must feel really quick and fast. And so they don't need to, they're not feeling like they're waiting long. Um, this is much better than just simply having a blank white screen um, and the content loading in afterwards. Accessibility is really, really important uh, to us here at Mobify. And I think it's something that often is sort of put to the side and, and left for later. And I encourage everyone to think about accessibility as you design and as you build, uh, taking the care and attention to make sure that your experiences are accessible to all users uh, and not just the able-bodied ones. Here's a great example of, of something that's often forgotten about in terms of uh, dealing with colorblindness. Here's an example of a form, uh, pretty standard form, but if I submit that form with nothing in it, I'm gonna get a bunch of error states. And here I can clearly see that the error state uh, has occurred, the text label has changed to red, the outline has changed to red, the inside of the field has changed to red. I can clearly see that. However, uh, to simulate what someone would, it would be like uh, who's colorblind, they would see this, right? And, and there's no indication to the shopper that an error has occurred. And so if I can't see those contrast changes, that indication is clear, I'm gonna be really frustrated. Why didn't my form work? What's happening? Um, so it's really important uh, that we, we make ex uh, field active and error states accessible. And the way we do this is, I encourage everyone to change more than two variables. So change the color and change the line thickness um, of the field or the uh, selected area. Here on this site on Blair.com, when you engage with the search field, the search field changes drastically in terms of its thickness along the bottom edge, clearly indicating that this is active. Another great place you can do this is in your visual selectors. Um, you know, as a designer, I love to just simply change those nice gray outlines to a nice thin black outline. Very classy, uh, looks fantastic, but from a colorblind, colorblind shopper's perspective, it isn't enough to indicate that I've selected that. So here again with Blair, we've changed both the color and the thickness to make it drastically different uh, to clearly indicate which color chip has been selected. A tool I'm really excited uh, about these days is, is a tool called Contrast Grid. Um, and this is amazing because what it does is it allows you to take your color palette for your experience, uh, put it into this simple website, and it creates a cascading grid of color and text combinations and gives you a color contrast ratio and a compliance rating for that uh, combination. So if you look along the top uh, row where we've got a white background and colored text, uh, DNP means it does not qualify for accessible standards. AAA is the ultimate, that's uh, what you need to aim for. A AA 18 means that combination will work, but it will only work at very large sizes, so above 18 points. Uh, AA is slightly, uh, uh, is, a, is a good point to try to achieve. Um, and so use this tool to really point out all the great color combinations you can use that still fall within accessible standards. Uh, this is a great tool I would encourage everyone to start using. The next topic is around typing and input. And really typing sucks on the phone, uh, to be frank. And, but there's a lot we can do to make typing and inputting content a lot easier. And it really starts with using contextual keyboards. I see this constantly. Uh, every field type uh, and content type that you're, you're entering deserves its own keyboard type. So if you're entering in simple text, you use the classic text keyboard. However, search, URL entry, numeric entry, email entry, password entry, date and time, all have their own specific keyboard and should be utilized. This is definitely critical in your checkout uh, to make sure that every form field can be entered in as fast as possible. And just as a, a bit of a helpful hint, I often see uh, these things miss because sites are reviewed using Chrome DevTools, which don't trigger uh, contextual keyboards. So I would encourage everyone to make sure you're testing all of your experiences in an actual device so that you can see the keyboards um, are being used correctly. The other two little subtle things I'll cover here is around disabling autocorrect. 
You don't want the device to be correcting address or street names for the shopper. Let them in, enter them in as they see fit. And don't and so turn turning autocorrect off is a simple line of text relating to your form field. The other one uh, that is often forgotten about is enabling autocomplete. Um, you know, both Android and iOS have great autocomplete for entering in saved information based on the sh on the shopper's contact information. And by using the create correct autocomplete tag in your forms, then the right keyboard suggestions will come up. Uh, so you can just quickly enter that information fast and efficiently. We encourage people to enter in complex passwords. Uh, it is uh, the problem is is you enter in these complex passwords and you really don't know if you've made a made a mistake or not, and then you end up having to correct yourself and doing it all over again. Simply show providing the shopper with a show or hide button can allow them to control exposing that obfuscated password and seeing if they've made an error so that they can enter it in the first time correctly. Having a great auto-suggest uh, is really critical to help shoppers find the content that they're after. And auto-suggest needs to, needs to suggest great product categories that might relate to their search query, but also great products. Uh, often I see simply product suggestions in the auto-suggest, and often shoppers are simply looking for a, pro a general product category, so make sure that those are prioritized over the specific products. I love this. Uh, this is an old example from Staples uh, that they did, a couple, I think a couple years ago now, where they took the approach with their guest checkout of simply asking for information, only asking for the information they need to ship that product to you. Um, so it was a condensed checkout that included five fields, a single field for your name, a single field for shipping address, phone, email, and credit card. Very simple. Really look closely at your forms or in your checkouts, in your registration forms. Are you asking the bare minimum of the shopper uh, so that they can fill this out and get on with shopping? Entering in your address is one of the, the most frictionful experiences of checkout. So provide the shopper with a great auto-suggest tool. There's a lot of simple APIs. There's one from Google that simply auto-suggests based on a postal code or is entering in your address. Here I'm entering in my postal code. It gives me my suggestion and it fills out the form completely. Also make sure that when a shopper makes an error that they know that they've made that error and that uh, it's clearly indicated when they make the error rather than submitting the form and then having to hunt that down and fix it. And another example of doing work for the shopper is there should be no need why a shopper has to select what credit card they're entering in. We can simply detect that based on the very first number they start entering, change the appropriate credit card graphic so that they have a clear indication that the right card is being entered. And then we can also change the verification number uh, graphic so that they can clearly see where that is. There should be no need to have this uh, ubiquitous uh, question mark that you tap, you get a modal window, and then see a, a number of different credit card um, credit cards with verification number locations, and you have to figure out which one is yours. We can do all this work for the shopper. When you're entering in complex strings of information, such as phone numbers, not including spaces really creates a visual challenge for the shopper to see if they've made any error in the middle of their entry. And so by using input masks, we can format phone numbers, uh, emails, credit cards with spaces so that they can easily comprehend that they've entered in the information correctly. Ultimately, it comes down to making sure all of your form fields are accessible. Do them every single time. As designers, don't get clever with your form entry. Do it the same, same way on mobile every single time. And that means putting all of your forms in a single column, ensuring that there is a clear form label above the form field, helpful hint text is included in the field, error messages are uh, informative, and explain why you need things. So things like email address or phone number, why are you asking for this information? I just want you to ship me my product. Clearly explain why you need this information so that they feel confident in providing it to you. The last category of best practices is around creating obvious interactions. Going back to the, the idea of, of shoppers being influenced by native apps, the idea of app-like experiences on the mobile web 
um, has become really popular and has allowed us to create very native app-like experiences on the mobile web. And one of those is in uh, pinning navigation headers to the top of the page. This gives easy access to navigation, cart, and search for the shopper as they browse long pages. Um, but what it all, I also encourage everyone to do is often when you first land on a site, the header can be, can be quite large. It can include promo information, it could in include uh, exposed search fields. And if you kept this pinned to the top of the page, you're really uh, not really maximizing your vertical space. So when the shopper starts to scroll, maybe, maybe animate the header down to a minimized version. So it gets out of the way, but it's still easily accessible to the shopper. On the opposite, opposite end of that, we have footers. And I think we all need to start rethinking how we think about footers. Uh, the web has, you know, it has been the dumping ground of information. Here's two examples, uh, one from the Joe Fresh app and one from the Sears website. Why is the app have no footer and the, and the website have a giant footer? I think we, re we need to rethink why we have footer content and maybe consider moving that content into the main navigation or the drawer where it's more appropriate. Footers are meant for contextual content. If you think of a book, what's the footer on a book? It's typically the page number, maybe the chapter you're in, maybe the title of the book, maybe even footnotes. All very contextual to the, the, the page you are on in that book. And we need to start thinking about that in terms of the mobile web and how we treat footers. Drawer navigations are great, we all love them. Uh, we, used, we trigger them with the, the classic hamburger menu. The one thing that is sometimes forgotten is we don't let the shopper dig super deep into the site using the drawer. So I'd encourage all uh, uh, designs to make sure that the, the shopper can dig you know, multiple levels deep into as all the sub and tertiary uh, categories that the site has to offer. Studies have shown though that if you can expose your navigation to the shopper at all times, um, it, is much, it is much more engaged with and much more, much easier for the shopper to find exactly what they're after. Here with Beyond the Rack, we were lucky where they had five main product categories which we could expose to the shopper at all times. A great new way to deal with these two patterns is sort of taking a mixed approach. On Lancome, we had the classic drawer navigation where you know, it contains a lot of different content, allows for deep navigation into all the tertiary uh, cat categories. However, what we did is we surfaced the most popular categories and exposed those as a, a pinned navigation bar here at the top uh, so that shoppers could quickly jump into those most popular categories. So taking a mixed approach uh, can work really, really well. I think we sometimes underestimate the power of the great screens that our devices have these days and that a lot of shopping decisions can happen on the PLP or the product listing page. Um, for certain product types that don't have a lot of product options, I think adding a add to bag or buy now button in the PLP is a really powerful tool to have shoppers be able to quickly get in and get out uh, of the shopping experience. Once they've added products to their cart, we need to make sure we, we give them a powerful uh, mini cart. And often as designers, we get a little bit clever. And here's an example on the right where we have a great animation indicator that a product has been added to your cart. And we give a little drop down indicating that that item has been added and that they can check out. However, it isn't blocking enough. It doesn't force them to, make, to consider, do I want to check out now? And so what we encourage is a best practice is a blocking modal style, where the shopper is blocked from continuing. They have three choices, they can con or two choices, they can check out, or they can con continue shopping, or they can dismiss, which is really the same as continue shopping. And this showed that it has performed much better than a more subtle uh, action indicator. Dropdowns should be avoided at all costs, even in desktop. Dropdowns are a mystery to the shopper. They don't know what they're going to get when they, when they access them, they have to read the content of what's in that drop down and they have to try to accurately make a selection. Here on Staples is a great example of I'm somehow supposed to select the right paper from this crazy list uh, uh, that's presented to me. Instead, what we'd encourage everyone to use is visual selectors on both color and size and 
use quantity steppers for, for selecting quantity. Simply adding uh, and subtracting you know, single units is more likely to happen than having to enter in say 20 of a quantity. Um, so using quantity steppers is much better. We all love hiding content within accordions. Uh, it's a great tool for collapsing complex uh, hier hierarchical content into a simple interface. But studies have shown there's some best practices we should follow around this. We should, we should all of our iconography should be on the left-hand side so that the, the shopper's eye can start there and move across and read the word of the label. Placing the, that iconography on the far right-hand side aesthetically creates a nice balance, but it forces the shopper's eye to travel all the way across and try to interpret what that icon will do. Studies have also shown that using a plus and an X is the base, best symbol to use in communicating an open and close mechanic. Using a minus or uh, the little uh, pyramid or triangle shapes uh, is not as clear for shoppers. Another app like experience is full row selectors. Often what happens when you have a radio button uh, selector is the shopper has to select the individual radio button or maybe they even have to tap just the text. However, the entire row, they should be able to click into the white space and select that content so that uh, they can just tap anywhere in that row and it's selected. Carousels, uh, I think ultimately the best practices don't use carousels. Uh, but if you do use carousels, make sure that every bit of content you have in there is relevant and highly curated. And, in, and assume that probably the second, third, fourth slide will never be viewed. We think it's a much better approach to just simply take those, those promotional cards and stack them on the page for the user to scroll uh, past them rather than putting them into a carousel. And then finally, I wanna leave on the idea of making sure that your guest checkout is your default checkout. 20% of shoppers abandon their cart because they don't want to register uh, or sign in or sign up for your experience. They simply want to pay and get their products. And here's a, a classic look of how a, a, a checkout typically operates. From the P PDP or the product detail page, we have our view bag or checkout. We land on our cart page, we look through our cart page and then we see the secure checkout button. We, we tap that. And then we're often provided with this blocking page which wants to encourage us to sign up or, or, or sign in, or it wants to log us in as a guest, often asking us for an email address, and then finally moving us to checkout. An approach we would encourage everyone to, to do is constantly push to the checkout. Here on the PDP, uh, you can instantly go to checkout or continue shopping. When you view your mini cart, you can either view your cart or go immediately to checkout. And then once you're on the cart, you can proceed to checkout with no blocking sign up or register uh, or email entry uh, on the page. And instead, what we've done is we're, we're smart, being smarter about it. We're using email entry at the beginning of the form to say, hey, enter in your email so that we can uh, provide you with an order confirmation. And then in the background, we can detect if they are already have an account. And then later in the checkout process, prompt them for their password to log in. This and blocking them and getting them in that mode of feeling like they're just quickly able to check out. So that kind of wraps up uh, uh, our collection of best practices today. We touched on the idea of making decisions with defaults. Use these best practices as your first uh, decision and then go from there. Use best practices to reduce anxiety by over communicating to the shopper. Make sure that every time you are requesting a shopper to enter in information, you're making that as fast and friction-free as possible. And you're always being 100% obvious with your interactions and experiences at all times. I also wanted to call out the fact that many of these are best practices we've utilized at Mobify, but there's been a lot of research done in the background by uh, people like the Bamerd Institute and Luke W., and a lot of the contributors to Smashing Magazine or Medium.com. Uh, all of this stuff is, is being talked about on the web. People are running research experiments and publishing the results. I would encourage you all to keep a clear eye on these uh, sites because they, they're publishing new 
insights all the time. And all of these new insights should be utilized as quickly as possible to try and reduce all of that friction in the shopping experience. So thank you very much for your attention today. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at JB Allenson or LinkedIn at JB Allenson. Um, we will be publishing a, uh, a written guide of our best practices, uh, which will be released and sent to all attendants next week. Um, so thank you again, and I hope you found all of these best practices useful. Great, thanks JB. Uh, now we'll jump into some of your questions. Uh, the first one here I'll just address quickly was, will the presentation be available online? And yes, we will be sending um, the full recording to everyone who registered for this webinar um, tomorrow morning. So keep an eye out for that in your inbox. Um, now a couple questions from today. Uh, just a reminder, you can still submit questions through the webinar dashboard or by tweeting them using the hashtag mobile UX 2017. So the first one here, do these best practices affect page speed or loading times? And I would say in general, uh, they don't. The one best practice you need to always be careful of is the use of animation. Uh, animation should be used uh, appropriately and sparingly so that it doesn't slow down the experience or give the perception of slowing it down. We can use animation in, in our uh, preloading uh, content indicators to actually make it perceive as being faster. Uh, so it's definitely some, some, most of these won't affect page speed, but always be careful of animation. Great, another one here, what sort of conversion rate increases do you see with address lookup tools? Uh, we haven't seen any uh, drastic effects or, or tracking that, um, but what we do see is just that it, it can affect drop off entirely. Um, so a, a shopper might start entering in this information or get frustrated and just simply give up. Um, and we want to make sure that, that that conversion funnel through the checkout is as smooth as possible. Great. And here we've got a question from Carrie. What is the URL for the contrast grid web page? And if that's a long one, we could also include it in the uh, follow up after this. Yeah, webinar. we'll definitely we'll definitely send that out. Uh, it's a great tool. I only recently discovered it about a month ago. Um, it's done by a small agency and it's uh, totally available for everyone to use. Great, so we'll make sure to include that in follow up email. Uh, another question here, how do you feel about lazy load on mobile to handle many products on a given page? Uh, lazy loads is fine. I think the best practice should be to load uh, maybe 50 products and then give a button at the end of that that says load more. So put the, put the control into the hands of the shopper to trigger additional loading. We're not a big fan of infinite loading. Um, and uh, always put that control in the hands. But yes, if you can do lazy loadings in a smart way so that it doesn't slow down performance, it can, work, it can be a great, uh, great way to increase performance. And what best practices do you recommend for multiple email confirmation fields? Oh, this is a great one. Um, we actually recommend taking a positive approach. Don't actually ask for them to enter it in twice. Simply assume that the first time they've entered it is correct. And just make sure you have a fantastic reset password uh, flow so that if they did make a mistake, they can, they can get back to you uh, creating a, an account or signing in after the fact. But we like to take a positive approach in terms of account setup of simply asking for an email address and a password only once. And how important are the accessibility best practices if it only affects a small percentage of your customers? Uh, this is a great question because I think that really, it doesn't really matter how big your audience is in terms of accessibility. It's simply the right thing to do. You need to treat, treat every, every one of your shoppers as a great customer and make sure that they all have amazing experiences shopping with you. Just because they use a screen reader to, to shop doesn't, doesn't mean that their experience can't be as amazing uh, as my experience. And are all of these best practices from today for both web and apps? I think so. Um, I think the only big difference between apps and, and mobile web these days is apps, apps need to be, you need to think about navigation a little bit different uh, in terms of apps. Typically, a user flow with an app is a very linear in and out kind of ex experience where a mobile web, you can really drop in and drop out at any point. So the navigation is the one piece that 
might be applied a little bit different, but in general, all of these form field entry best, pra best practices, um, you know, apply for both, both platforms. And have you seen any apps using a zip first address entry system? And if so, have you seen positive results? Uh, yes, we have. Uh, we've actually built sites using this as well. I think this is a, a great tool because it's a simple, um, I can enter in one simple string of information and my entire address is captured from that. However, you have to really think about your audience. Uh, postal codes and zip codes are much different in, in, in America as they are in Canada and Britain. Uh, in Canada, a, a postal code is a very small number of houses, where in the States, you know, 90210, I, which I use all the time when I'm pretending to shop in the States, uh, is a humongous area. Uh, so you have to think about that and use the appropriate API and the uh, appropriate structure for your customer type and your, and your location. Great. And we'll take one more question here. Why should we be avoiding carousels? A carousel should be avoided because they're a mystery. They're kind of like drop downs. You really have no idea what you're going to get when you when you interact with them. And to be honest, I don't believe shoppers sit on a page wanting to scroll through a carousel. They're seeking out a product uh, that they're after. They're looking for a deal. And they don't want to work for a deal. To stop and try to interact with a carousel, I think is is not true. I don't think shoppers do this. And why don't we just simply show the content on the page? If it deserves to be in a carousel, it deserves to be put out in the open. Um, and in general on mobile, I wouldn't be as concerned about a vertical length of a page. Um, you just have to be a bit smart about it and make sure that every piece of content you're putting on there has value to the shopper. Great. Now I know we're coming to the end of the time here. We'll take one more short question. Um, and anyone who we didn't address your questions today, we'll make sure to follow up with you. But the last one here, how many payment options should be provided to the customers in a mobile app? What is ideal? I don't think there's any right number. The approach we're taking these days with, with uh, services like Apple Pay or the new payment request API is providing the shopper with a panel where they can pick the payment type and then being smart in the background of changing the payment flow based on how, what they've choose to, to check out with. Um, I don't think there's, you know, classically there's a credit card, there's Apple Pay, maybe there's payment request, there's PayPal, uh, maybe there's a one or two other third party options, but make sure you put those in the appropriate place in your flow so that you're not, you know, often what happens is these additional payment options is put after the credit card entry uh, and not upfront. And so create custom flows for your shoppers based on which payment options they choose. Perfect. Well, that's all the time we have for today. A big thanks to JB and our co-sponsor, Astound Commerce, as well as our audience for all your great questions today. Uh, just a note, as I mentioned, tomorrow you'll receive a recorded version of this webinar along with an exclusive blog post from Astound's Director of Interactive Strategy. Uh, so be sure to keep an eye on your inbox for that. As JB mentioned, we'll also be releasing the complete mobile commerce UX best practices guide next week. Uh, so we'll make sure to email that to everyone who's on this webinar um, so that you don't miss it. So expect that next Tuesday. Now that's all the time we have for today. Thanks everyone and hope you have a great day.